haven't said this in a few weeks, so I'm going to remind you, if you haven't yet gotten a, a, bo a bookmark, uh, please take one. There are some on the table in the back. There are some in uh, the lobby in the other building there. Uh, and if you're online and you want one, just send me an email, pastor at buckallchurch.org. I will send you as many as you want. Uh, we have a lot of these. We would encourage you to mark and to read your Bibles on a regular basis. On one side, there is uh, the Lord's Prayer. On the other side, it says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, along with Buckhall Church reference as well. I invite you to take those. They are completely free of charge. We just want you to be there. And if you don't have a Bible to put one in, you don't have a Bible that you can read, that you can understand, that you can spend time in, we have free Bibles available for you in the lobby on the table on the left as you walk into the building. Uh, feel free to take one. We have a large print one. We have some regular print ones. Feel free to take them uh, and go home and spend time in them. If you're online, again, send me an email, uh, and I will be happy to send you a Bible uh, if you don't have one available to you. Now, how many of you have ever been tired? How many of you have ever been bone-tired? Yeah, right, right. If you're a parent, I assume your hand is in the air at this point. All right. Now, I'm going to tell a, a quick story. Uh, it illustrates one time I was extremely tired. I may have told this before. I don't remember, but I'm going to tell it again. So if you heard it, just play along like you haven't heard it, and we'll be fine. Uh, back in the summer of 2016, I had a stretch of very, very, very long three weeks. It doesn't seem like very long, but when you hear what I did in three weeks, you'll understand. I, it started with a week or 10 days at what we call the Jeremiah Project. It's a middle school ministry up in Winchester, Virginia. Spent 10 days on staff as the program director. I was the spiritual leader for the week. I had to preach every night. I had to, to work with the kids and the adults and lead a work team and do all this stuff. A long, wonderful, beautiful week of mission. That is me and my work team and me and the staff at Jeremiah Project uh, that summer. I got home from that on Saturday afternoon. I was home for 24 hours, maybe, uh, in which I was looking for these pictures. I took 27 pictures of my one-year-old daughter in those, 20, in those 12 hours. Uh, I was so happy to see them. Uh, left 12 hours, like 24 hours later for REACH, a high school mission project in Hurricane, West Virginia. Uh, it is not hurricane, it is hurricane. If you've ever been there, you understand. Putnam County, uh, right on the Ohio border. Uh, that's why work team's in uh, REACH. We had, at JP, we had about 80 folks. At REACH, they have 450 folks. Uh, all high schoolers, all crazy, all, just no sleep, all week, all week. Uh, my work team, they're doing work in Hurricane. Uh, came back from that. The next day, Sunday morning, we had worship at church. Then we had a VBS meeting, and then we had VBS that week. 200 kids, 100 adults. Absolute mass chaos, uh, exhaustion, and in the middle of that week, on Thursday, I left for Kansas City, Missouri, to a young preacher's conference at Church of the Resurrection, which is the largest church in the denomination. This was their new sanctuary as it was being built. Uh, I call it the Death Star uh, because it's kind of what it looks like, uh, but it's a wonderful sanctuary, uh, but that apparently was hot. That was the only two pictures I had from Kansas City that week. Uh, it spent a week, almost a week, in Kansas City at this preacher's conference with 250 folks. Now... That is in the space of three and a half weeks, that is, I wrote it down, 3,000 miles of travel and spending time nonstop with about 1,600 different people. I am an extrovert. I love people, but y'all, I was done. I was done. I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to talk to anybody. And it was helped by the fact that I knew when we got back, we were leaving the next day on vacation to the beach. So the whole last week, I'm like, my eye is, it's like a light at the end of a very, very dark tunnel. I can see the break coming. I know it's here. And the days just drag on and on. And when I got home, I was so exhausted. Exhausted from people, emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted. Every inch of my being was worn out. Here's the good news, though. If you've ever been there, at that state where you are thoroughly exhausted, you don't know you could take another step. You are not alone. There are folks in the scriptures who have been in that same place. And that's where we're going to pick up today. We've been in this series since January, going through the book of Mark. And two weeks ago, you'll remember, if you have your Bibles in Mark 4, we, we picked up the story in Mark chapter 4, and we talked about the parable of the scattering of the seed, the parable of the sower. And Jesus, at that moment, begins teaching on the side of a lake. And he begins teaching. He teaches the parable of the sower. He teaches the parable of the lamp. He teaches multiple parables. Ends with the parable of mustard seed. And then last week we talked about when he was done teaching, him and the disciples got in a boat. They went across the lake. Meanwhile, on the lake, what did they run into? A storm that Jesus had to calm. 
They get to the other side of the lake. They encounter a demon-possessed man that Jesus casts the demons out of into pigs. Then they get back in the boat, and they go to another part of the lake shore. And when they get to the other side of the lake shore, they encounter Jairus, this religious official whose daughter is dying, who is desperate, begging Jesus for help. And there's a crowd of people, and they're going to Jairus' house. But on the way to Jairus' house, they encounter the woman who's been unclean for 12 years, who comes and touches the hem of Jesus' robe, so desperate for a healing. And she's healed, and Jesus says, your faith has made you well. And then they get to Jairus' house. His daughter has died. There's a crowd of people mocking Jesus for engaging with him. For Jairus and his family, they take Peter, James, and John, and Jairus and his wife, and they go into the little girl's room. This girl who has died, and he grabs her hand, and he says, Talitha kum, get up, little girl. And she gets up, and she walks. But that's not where it stops. They go back to Nazareth, Jesus and the disciples, to his hometown. He is then cast out of his hometown. He's rejected by his hometown. We talked about that several weeks ago. And then after that story, he sends the disciples out. This is the, the Mark's version of the sending of the 72. Sends the disciples out to go heal and teach and cast out demons and practice ministry for a little while in the real world. Meanwhile, Jesus goes to village to village and he keeps teaching. While they're gone, they find out that Jesus' cousin and the precursor, John the Baptist, has been killed by Herod, has been executed. And they come back together. The disciples from their journeys around the towns, Jesus from his village around the towns, and they are exhausted. Emotionally, spiritually, physically, they're done. Jesus knows they're done. Jesus is probably done. And so Jesus says this in Mark 6, which is where we're going to be today in verse 31. Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. There's that light at the end of the tunnel. He said this because even more people were coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. That sounds like a really good place to be, doesn't it? They could be alone. The vacation awaits, a time of restoration, a time to rest, a time to restore their soul, to reconnect, to recharge their batteries. But then we get the next verse. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got to where they were going ahead of the disciples. They're not leaving them alone. They're not going to. They're going to have to encounter more people. And I imagine at this point when the disciples get out of the boat and they see the people, they know Jesus isn't going to ignore them. And so they probably are much like a pastor's wife or pastor's kids or maybe you have a talk to a person in your family that's like this. They start talking after church and you're like, guys, like, we got lunch. Let's go. And they're just talking and talking. Like, fine, Jesus, just do your thing. Jesus, do your thing. But we need to go. And it gets after, he's been teaching and talking to these folks for a while and it gets late. And the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, it's kind of late. It's getting dark. I think those people need to go eat. So let them go so they can go find something to eat. Now, this isn't in Scripture, but I have a strong feeling the disciples weren't really worried about the crowd. They were hungry. They were tired. They were saying, that's my Jesus, who I want to spend time with. Send these people away so I can recharge and I can spend time with Jesus. I'm, I need Jesus for me. These people need to go away. But then Jesus says this. He looks at them and he says, you feed them. You feed them. And the disciples, I imagine, are shocked. They're taken aback. You can see that in their response. With what? How are we going to feed them? What are you talking about? They're puzzled. They're confused. They don't know what Jesus is talking about. And they don't want to know what Jesus is talking about. They just want to leave. And they want the people to leave. They're hangry. A little hungry and angry and cranky, right? That they just want this to end. They're tired. They're frustrated. And then Jesus says, go and feed them. You feed them. The ask is so simple, but yet the ask is, is so difficult at the same time. Jesus is saying, you take care of them. 
Take what you have, give it to them, let God feed them, and then, and then you can eat. But after you eat, you need to share. All in these two little words, feed them. And friends, Jesus is not just saying that to the disciples 2,000 years ago. He's saying it to you and me today. You feed them. Now, the disciples had a myriad of excuses why they couldn't feed the people, why they weren't going to feed the people. And the truth is, many of us and many of our churches have the same excuses. So we're going to walk through the excuses and the solutions that the, the, the disciples walked through. And I think many of us will find very familiar. The first one is this. They were overwhelmed. Anybody ever felt overwhelmed with the tasks in front of you? Yeah, right? Like, I, I just, I can't even process what I'm being asked to do. They're overwhelmed with emotion, overwhelmed with fatigue, overwhelmed by the situation. And this is how Jesus addresses it. We read this uh, in verse 34. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. You see, Jesus sees the situation. All the disciples see is, oh no, we have to do this again. Oh no, there's more people. But Jesus sees the people and he has compassion on them. So the first thing we need to do is when we're overwhelmed is we need to have compassion. Compassion for the situation. That word you see up there, that, that ugly looking word is the, the transliteration of the Greek word of compassion, splanchthon. Splanchnon. It's a great name, great word. And it basically means, it doesn't mean feel sorry for it. It means to have guttural, internal turmoil because of what you're seeing. Jesus felt what these people were going through. He knew what they were going through and he felt it in his very core. Not just emotional, but with every fiber of his being. We need to have that compassion for the people, for the situations that we are overwhelmed with. And then when we have compassion, we also need to not be an ostrich. Now, I don't mean the majestic African bird ostrich. I mean this kind of ostrich. Don't stick your head in the sand. Too many of us, when we get overwhelmed, even if we have compassion for what we're seeing or encountering, we just kind of stick our head in the sand and say, not my problem. If I don't see it, I don't have to deal with it. If I don't hear it, I don't have to think about it. I'm not going to worry. I can't do it, so I'm just going to stick my head in the sand. Don't be an ostrich and have compassion. So we've, we've solved the overwhelmed part. We've taken the first steps. But now that we, we've sort of gotten our head around the situation, now what? We don't know where to start. Where do we begin? How do I even begin to solve this problem that I see, that I have compassion for? How do I do it? I see it, but I'm lost. I don't know where to begin. This is what Jesus says in verse 37. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. Now, the, the Greek there, when it says earn enough money, it says 200 denarii. 200 denarii, is, is a, that's the currency they use. And essentially this, one day's wage for your average worker was one denarii. They would have had to work for 200 man days to make the money to feed the crowd. If you divide that by the disciples, that's each man would have had to work 16 to 17, 10-hour days to make the money that it would take to buy the food to feed those thousands of people. So we need to, first thing we need to do is we need to look around and see what we do have. Don't worry about what we don't have. Just take stock of what we do have around us. What are the options? What are the resources? What do we have? Not what don't we have, but what do we have? And the second thing is this, we need to ask what? Ask what? What do we have? I'm not worried about how, because here's the thing. We jump so quickly from the problem to trying to find a solution. We, we start with this mindset of, well, we can't get there because we have a scarcity mindset. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough people. I don't have enough talent. I don't have enough resources. That's a mindset of scarcity. Jesus' ministry then and now never, never starts with scarcity. It assumes abundance. It assumes an abundance of resources. Why? Because God knows there is an abundance of resources. We just haven't found them. We haven't looked in the right places. So often we just assume that we don't have it instead of looking around to see what we do have. 
Don't worry about the how. Worry about what we do have. So we didn't know where to start. Now we know where to start. We were overwhelmed. We solved that. But now we've looked around and we realize what? We don't have enough. We simply don't have enough to our mind. And this is what Jesus said. Or they said the story. The disciples come back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus didn't ask any questions. He took the five loaves, two fish. He looked up to heaven, and he blessed them. Y'all, there are, I don't know how many people in this room today, but there are five loaves of bread up here. If anybody wants one after the service, you're welcome to take one home. I don't need them in my house. But there are five loaves of bread. I don't think those five loaves, we were being generous, people were hungry. I don't think it would feed everybody in this room. I really don't. When I served at my last church in Gainesville, it was a Sunday, we were serving communion, and we had a bumper crowd. We, we weren't expecting the bumper crowd. For whatever reason, we had a huge crowd that Sunday. And we pre-bought the Hawaiian loaves, the only loaves that should be used for communion outside of Lent. Uh, God's bread, gift to the world. But we had these Hawaiian loaves pre-bought, and the typical math is one loaf of Hawaiian bread in communion will last between 80 to 100 people, depending on how you give out pieces. I like to give out lunch-sized pieces. Some people give out crumbs, but 80 to 100 people is about what that loaf will feed. And we had a big crowd at 8 and a big crowd at 9.30, and we're looking around at 11, and I leaned over to John, the senior pastor, about 10 minutes in the service, said, communion is going to be really tight because I know how many loaves we have left, and I see how many people are in the crowd. We had three loaves left, and there were at least 400 people out there. And I'm like, what are we going to do? I can get more juice. I've got more juice in the fridge. I don't have any more bread. What are we going to do? Friends, I tell you the truth. When we got done with communion that Sunday, we had almost one full loaf left. I don't know how it happened. I, I don't understand how it happened. I did, was not any less stingy than I usually am. But we had more bread. See, we, we look at it and say we don't have enough, but when Jesus blesses it, when Jesus blesses it, things can happen. So that's our, our step for don't have enough. We bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Whatever you have, bring it to Jesus. See, to embrace this abundance, to embrace that, is to embrace Jesus' desire and to embrace Jesus' command to feed the people. It's not a conflict to be solved. It is not an issue to be resolved. It's not a question to be answered. And some of you folks that think like engineers, hear me, it is not a problem to be engineered. It is not a problem that needs to be re-engineered. That's the problem. We try to do it ourselves. We try to make it last instead of bringing it to Jesus. Bring what we have and bring everything to Jesus. Bring your prayers, bring your talents, bring your things, bring your people, bring it all to Jesus. Because when you bring it all to Jesus, Jesus can do things we would never imagine. That are even beyond the comprehension of our mind. Bring it all to Jesus. Don't hold anything back trying to, to do a little bit yourself. Bring it all to Jesus. So we don't have enough. We've solved that problem. Now we have enough, but now the question is, I have the resources. Jesus has blessed the resources. Now, how do I actually do this? What are the logistics? Y'all like to plan. This is where y'all get hung up. How are we going to do this? This is what Jesus says. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. You should catch this part. He kept giving the bread to the disciples. Why? So they could distribute it to the people. Notice it doesn't say the disciples figured out a distribution system. The disciples figured out a plan. The disciples figured out an equitable way to share the bounty. No, they just took it from Jesus. And they took it to the people as Jesus instructed. So you, you don't know how. The first thing we got to do is open our heart and open our hands. And say, Jesus, give me what you've blessed. That I might use it for your glory. Give it to me, let's go, and then distribute it according to his instructions. Not our plans, but his will. We just pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, your will be done. Distribute it according to his will. Go and feed the people. And sometimes that is literal, and sometimes that is figurative. Feeding with love, feeding with mercy, feeding with grace. Sometimes it's literally taking a loaf of bread to somebody that's hungry and saying, here. So, we figured out the how. We've got the distribution figured out. Now what? What's next? 
What do we do? Well, the scripture says. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. How many did they start with? Five loaves and two fish. They have 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. Most scholars agree on the conservative side, 15 to 20,000 people were there that day. Some say more. Fed from five loaves and 12, or two fish, and they had 12 baskets left over at the end. So what do we do? The first thing we need to do is we need to give thanks to God. Give God his glory and credit. And here's the problem. A lot of times we give thanks to God, but we don't want to give God all the credit. Our joy sounds something like, Hey, God, I thank you so much for the resources so I could feed those people. God, thank you so much for inspiring me to go and do this work. No. Give God the glory, but give God the credit. It is all to God's credit. We are just instruments of God, and we do it. And they pick up the leftovers. They pick up the extravagant abundance that's left. And, and what do they do? It doesn't end. We need to keep going. Take up the abundance, whether it's literal leftover food or whether it is leftover communion bread or whether it is a leftover overflow of grace and love. Take that and keep going. And keep going. Do something more. Transform the world. Don't let it stop with one action, with one event. Because here's the thing. Now we know the pattern. The next time we encounter a problem, the next time we encounter a situation that overwhelms us, we don't have to withdraw into ourselves because now we know how to do it. We've been overwhelmed, not a problem. I don't know where to start, not a problem. I don't know how to do it, not a problem. I don't have enough, not a problem. I'm going to follow Jesus' plan and Jesus' ideas and we're going to do it and then we're going to do it again and again and again. How many of you ever know who Matthew West is? Contemporary Christian musician. Uh, if you don't know him, I guarantee you know the songs he's written. Not only is he a great artist in his own right, but he's written many, many, many of the top, I don't know, thousand Christian songs of the last two decades. Wonderful songwriter. He wrote a song about a decade ago called Do Something. And this is how the song starts. I woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble. Thought we'd never, how'd we ever get so far down? How's it ever going to turn around? I turned my eyes to heaven and I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me. So I shook my fist at heaven and I said, God, why don't you do something? And he said, I did. I created you. Here's the thing. We're called to do something, to feed God's people, literally, figuratively. We're called to go out and do it, not once, but to do it again and again and again and again, friends, until every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Again and again until the kingdom of God reigns on earth. The work cannot stop at one action. The work cannot stop with one event. It goes on and on and on. I'll tell you another story. In mm, the mid-1700s, 1750s, there was a slave ship captain by the name of John Newton. Some of y'all might know who John Newton is. I've told this story before. John Newton was a slave captain, and he not only was a captain, but then he retired from the seafaring, and he continued to invest and profit off of the slave trade from Britain to Africa to North America and the Caribbean. And he had a spiritual awakening, and he, he realized there was a problem. He was part of the problem. But it wasn't just his problem. It was a global, macro, economic, social, moral problem that was being spearheaded by where he lived, the British Empire, which at the time was the greatest empire the world had ever seen. The sun never set on the British Empire. And they were part of the problem. And as one man, he, he was convinced that it needed to be fixed and needed to be changed. He became a priest in the Church of England. And in 1784, he was serving a parish in central London and a young man who was a member of parliament who had his own spiritual awakening came to him for counsel. He came and said, Reverend Newton, he said, I've had this, this spiritual awakening, this conversion moment where I am with Jesus. I want to worship Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. But I'm also in public life. 
And as a member of parliament, I feel like I'm a, a part of the problem. And I don't know if I should give up public life so I can focus on Jesus. And Reverend Newton told him, as well as some others, don't give up your public life. Use it to work for the glory of the kingdom. That man's name, you may have heard it, William Wilberforce, who was one of the driving forces in the abolition movement in England. In 1785, he went back to work in Parliament and became the face and the voice and one of the driving forces behind the movement to end the slave trade. Thirty years later, in 1807, the Slave Trade Act is passed. History tells us he was sitting in Parliament with tears streaming down his face as it was passed. That's great, but he didn't stop there. He didn't stop. He took that momentum and he continued to push it forward. He was overwhelmed and he solved it. He didn't know where to start, but he started somewhere. He didn't know what, he didn't have enough people or resources, but he found a way to get with people and to give it to Jesus and to let Jesus do work. And then 30 years later, three days before he died in 1833, Great Britain passed the, the Abolition Act that not only ended the slave trade, but abolished slavery throughout the British Empire. Three days before he died. He spent 50 years of his life, if you include John Newton, 70 years of work that started with just a few people who knew what was wrong and were pushing and didn't know how to do it, but they kept going. And they kept going. And they kept going. They didn't let it stop with one act, but they went on and on and From John Newton, the evangelist, to another evangelist. Anybody know who uh, Fred Craddock is? An American preacher uh, of, the la of the 20th century. Wonderful man, professor down at, at Candler School in Atlanta. Um, he tells a story, or told a story when he was alive, when he was in Winnipeg one mid-fall, mid-October. And he's staying in Winnipeg for a conference, and all of a sudden they get a two-and-a-half-foot snowstorm, which even for Winnipeg is unusual. Travelers like Craddock were stranded. They couldn't leave town. They couldn't go to the airport. They couldn't get on a plane. You can go to the train. The only, all the places in town were closed. Everybody was snowed in. The only place he could find something to eat was around the corner from his hotel at a soup, a, a, a deli cafe in a train station. The only thing I had on the menu was soup. And this is what he said. He ordered the soup. This is what he said. He said it was the awfulest gray-looking soup he'd ever had. But he was hungry and he needed something to eat. And there's several other people in this small little cafe. And then this woman comes in who doesn't have a coat on. She's just looking for somewhere warm and a warm meal because there's a two and a half foot blizzard outside. And when the, the owner of the shop realized that she wasn't going to be able to pay for the soup that she had ordered, he told her to leave. She couldn't have the soup. And he says what he said. And almost as if rehearsed, every single person in that little cafe got up and started toward the door. And the owner said, all right, she can stay. And when he sat back down to his gray soup, he said, I don't recall what was in that soup. But I do recall that when I ate, it tasted a little bit like bread and wine. Whether it's a macroeconomic issue like child slavery, like lack of clean water, like injustices around the world, that we feel we can't even get our brain around the size of the problem. Whether it's a community or a regional issue, or whether it's somebody who simply needs a warm literally just needs food. Jesus says, feed them. He says, feed them. Whether it's somebody at the Manassas hypothermia shelter who needs a shower and a cup of coffee, feed them. Feed them. You feed them, Jesus says. You, me. The disciples, you feed them. But here's the thing, that, cha that, that issue from Jesus is not a challenge. It's not a, a problem. It's not an opportunity for us to show off. It's not a puzzle. It's not a test. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to Jesus. See, much like the crowds and like the disciples and like the woman at the restaurant and like the people at the homeless shelter, the hypothermia shelter, and that all we want is to be fed. All we desire is to be fed. When I opened these breads this morning and put them on the altar, I walked out, I came back in to keep setting up, and I smelled the bread. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to eat the bread. I have a carb problem. But I wanted to eat the bread. I just desired to eat it. But here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus is a different kind of miracle worker. He doesn't just provide a miracle. 
He doesn't just provide the food. He provides the food and says, eat until you've had your fill, and then go and serve the same. Go and feed the people. Go and serve it. It's an inescapable need to serve what we've received. Not to hoard it for ourselves, but to go and share. That day on the side of the lake, a landing that was met by the disciples, it was met by the disciples with despair, with puzzlement, with frustration, with exhaustion. It ended with an embarrassment, an abundance of kingdom riches. And that was a teaching to them and a reminder to them and a teaching and a reminder to us today that when we are frustrated, when we are overwhelmed, when we don't know where to start, don't stop. Don't turn inward. Look, see what the problem is. Have compassion. Take stock of what you do have. Bring it all to Jesus. Ask Jesus to bless it. Open your hearts and hands. Receive what he gives you. Distribute it according to what he tells us. Give thanks to God for his glory and for his goodness. And then, friends, go again. And go again, and go again, until there is no more hunger. Until all the world knows who Jesus is. Until no one hungers and thirsts for the blood and the bread of Jesus Christ. May it be so, according to his will. Amen.